It's a great pleasure, pleasure to introduce Alison Wing. So Alison is a, uh, just starting out. She's a new professor at Florida State University and a recent graduate of our, of our, of our program where she worked with Kerry Emanuel. And Ali studies tropical convection and aggregation of convection, uh, clouds, tropical clouds, which is hugely important for uh, putting constraints on climate sensitivity. Great, thank you very much. It's an honor to be here. I um, unfortunately didn't ever have a chance to meet Ed Lorenz or Jill Charney in person. Um, Ed Lorenz died uh, just the year before I started as a graduate student at MIT. But my graduate advisor was Carrie Emanuel, and as we heard earlier, his was Jewel Charney. So Jewel Charney is my academic grandfather, so I feel like I'm still kind of connected to their legacy. Today I'm going to talk about some recent work I've done on convective aggregation, clouds, and climate. And this is showing an example of, of cloud clusters in, in the tropics. And so that this is a photograph from the International Space Station. And so this is this aggregation that I'm going to be talking about. And the three questions that I want to address are, what is convective self-aggregation? Why might it be important? And what is the climate sensitivity of radiative convective equilibrium, which is a idealization of the atmosphere involving the balance of radiative heating and radiative cooling and convective heating? And I think that this work is very much keeping in with the legacy of Charney and Lorenz, so that it focuses really on very basic physical mechanisms in our climate system. So, the question of what is convective self-aggregation, at least in the context in which I'm going to discuss it, is, is best shown by looking at a movie. So this is an animation from a simulation with a cloud resolving model. And here we're looking down on the top of the model domain. It's about 1,000 kilometers long in each direction. And the gray shading are clouds. And the colors, the red is humid air near the surface. And the whiter, which becomes blue eventually, is drier air near the surface. So as you can see, we have convection occurring across the whole domain, and that's indeed what we might expect to always be the case in radiative convective equilibrium, because it has the same sea surface temperature everywhere, the same sunlight coming in. It's a totally homogeneous environment. But that clearly doesn't happen. We have this development of an area of drier air that becomes devoid of convection. And as time progresses over tens of days in this simulation, we see this dry patch get larger and grow. And force the convection to be increasingly localized into what eventually is a single cluster. And so this is a really dramatic uh, transition here, and it's fascinating when this people first saw this phenomena emerge in numerical modeling. And as this transition occurred, we saw that that dry region became drier, but at the same time, the moist regions became moister. So we have this sort of transfer of energy between the two. And so this is what I call self-aggregation. It's this spontaneous transition from randomly distributed to organized convection despite homogeneous boundary conditions. And it has been found to occur in a variety of different idealized numerical simulations uh, from cloud resolving models in different geometries to models with parameterized convection. And it, the work on it has really exploded in, in recent years. So, What, what actually causes this? Well, in all the studies that have investigated it, one thing that really stands out is the importance of interactions with radiation. And so one of the key feedback mechanisms that drives this spontaneous organization of convection has to do with the interaction of long wave radiation with clouds and water vapor. So if we, in the moister areas of the domain, you have more clouds and convection and a moister atmosphere. And so you'd have smaller atmospheric long wave cooling because Clouds and water vapor are an absorber of long-wave radiation. Compared to the drier, more non-convecting areas where low clouds or low, moister lower troposphere can cool much more effectively to space through the more transparent upper troposphere. And so you have much larger cooling in the dry regions. And this one would then have a tendency on increasing the moisture and energy of these moist columns and making them continually favorable to convection, and that indeed occurs, and this constitutes a positive feedback that helps to localize this convection. Another feedback mechanism that has been found to operate in these simulations helping to drive this organization involves interactions with, between surface fluxes. And so one of the factors that controls the flux of enthalpy from the sea surface to the atmosphere 
are surface wind speeds. And so again, in our moist regions where we have more convection, we have stronger surface winds because of convective gustiness and stronger large scale circulations compared to the dry, more non-convective regions where those are smaller. So all things being equal, this would cause us to have larger surface fluxes in our moist convecting regions, which is again an extra source of energy uh, for those columns and more favorable for convection. Now this isn't the only thing that affects surface fluxes and later on other factors can become important, but at least initially, this seems to be an important response. So what is convective self-aggregation? It's this spontaneous clustering of convection in a homogeneous environment that's driven by these radiative and surface flux feedbacks and importantly, their interaction with convection. Now, so why is it important? Well, in the movie I showed you, there was this dramatic spatial reorganization of convection, but that's not the only thing that happens. Self-aggregation has an impact on the mean state. And so to investigate that in more detail, I'm gonna show you some results from another set of model of simulations, again in radiative convective equilibrium, this idealization using a cloud resolving model. And first I'll show you some that have this kind of interesting geometry. It's a very long, narrow channel, 12,000 kilometers by 200, but it's resolving the convective systems within that. And then later I'll compare that to a much, much smaller square domain in which you don't have this organization convection of convection at all. So what happens between the beginning of the simulations when it's not aggregated yet and the end when it's highly clustered? These are profiles of domain mean vertical profiles of a few different quantities, again from kind of the end of the simulation to the beginning. And so we see here on the left cloud fraction and as aggregation occurs, we have a decrease in high clouds. The middle column shows the domain mean temperature change. So as aggregation occurs, we have a warming of the troposphere that's fairly significant, a couple degrees. And most dramatically, as aggregation occurs, we have a drying out of the domain on average. So this is the change in relative humidity. And it dries out throughout the entire column, but is the largest in the sort of middle troposphere here. Now, this effect of aggregation on the mean state means that it has the potential to really impact climate especially if the tendency to aggregate is itself dependent on climate or on mean temperature. And so we wanted to address that question, and it turns out it's actually quite tricky to determine how aggregated an individual simulation is. This is a snapshot of one quarter of that long channel simulation, and we have here an aggregated region with lots of clouds and convection. And there's this other area here where it's, it's clear skies, basically, and there's actually large-scale subsidence in that region. And so one way of measuring self-aggregation is by measuring what fraction of the domain is covered by that large-scale subsidence. And that's what is shown here. And this metric goes up as the simulations aggregate. And these are all simulations at different temperatures, all the way from 280 Kelvin to 310. And you see that the, the curves are kind of on top of each other. There's a lot of noise and variability. But if we take an average from the last 25 days, we get these dots here. And they show generally lower subsidence fraction, the warmer temperatures, which would indicate generally less aggregation with warming. Now, this is just one metric. There are alternate metrics that one could use. And another one um, is, is based on multiple scales of organization. And so it actually uses the distribution of what are called nearest to neighbor distances between convective entities and compares that to a random distribution. And you get, after some calculation, this index here where if it's greater than 0.5, it's more aggregated than random, and the larger it is, the more organized it is. And so again, if we take averages from the end of the simulation, we get these dots here. The two are just different ways of defining a grid cell that's convecting. And we have exactly the opposite response from our previous metric. This suggests that the warmer simulations are generally more aggregated. Although I would note that in both cases, there was a fairly large range of temperature in which it didn't really change much at all. In this case, it's the warmest 15 Kelvin that it doesn't really change with warming. So why might self-aggregation be important? Well, it warms and dries the mean state, it reduces high clouds. As we saw in the movie I showed, it enhances the dryness of dry regions, and it might be temperature dependent, but the exact nature of that has yet to really be determined. So this leads us to want to say, okay, well given all of this, what is the effect of self-aggregation and its variations on climate sensitivity on the response of the global mean temperature to irradiative forcing. Now that response is strongly influenced by how clouds change with warming. And so we would like to look at how clouds change with warming in these simulations. So not from beginning to end of an individual simulation, but just across our overall set of simulations. And that is shown here. 
And on the left side here, these are simulations from that little tiny square domain. So those ones don't have any organization at all. And on the right, we have our channel simulation that has this aggregation. And in both cases, we see an upward shift and decrease in the extent of high clouds and also a decrease in middle, in middle cloud fraction with warming. So the yellower colors here are the warmer temperatures. And this is seen in GCM simulations of radiative convective equilibrium as well. And a thermodynamic, thermodynamic mechanism for this was proposed by Sandrine Boni about a year and a half ago in relating this anvil cloud fraction extent to radiatively driven substance and static stability, which are, is a fairly basic thermodynamic mechanism. Now, of course, our end goal here is to figure out what the climate sensitivity is. And before I do that, you might be asking, why am I even talking about climate sensitivity and radiative convective equilibrium in the first place? Didn't we do this 40 to 50 years ago? Well, we did, and um, as has been brought up a few times in this symposium, one of Jewel Charney's um, contributions at the end of his career was to this, one of the first assessments, really, of global warming, um, this so-called Charney Report uh, from 1979. And in it, they said that we estimate the most probable global warming for a doubling of carbon dioxide to be near three degrees with a probable error of plus or minus 1.5. Now, this estimate was based on early GCMs as well as, quote, simpler models that appear to contain the main physical factors. And those simpler models were one-dimensional models of radiative convective equilibrium. And this assessment of climate sensitivity has been nearly unchanged in the four decades since then. We have a much better idea of the mechanisms that are driving it, but the actual number hasn't really changed all that much. And so the insights from this report that Charney led have endured the test of time because in this, Charney used hierarchies of models to identify robust responses and importantly connected it to physical principles. And so that is the goal of the work that I'm doing on this as well. And given that he himself wrote that these RCE models seem to contain the main physical factors, I think it's well motivated to return to them and look at them again, except now we can simulate radiative convective equilibrium with much more advanced models that have explicit convection and contain many more realistic representations of processes than these earlier ones did. And so that's what I've done here. And these are um, an estimate of the net climate feedback parameter. So it's just the net radiation at the top of the atmosphere as a function of temperature. And these lines here are the value of that at each of our simulations at a different temperature. And the black one is our simulations that have the organization. And the gray line is the simulations that do not. The slope of that line is this net feedback parameter. And as you can see, the slopes are clearly different. In fact, it's, the net feedback parameter is more negative when we have aggregation than when we don't, which implies that aggregation lowers climate sensitivity. Now, this could be a result of several different factors. One that could be that aggregation itself is, is becoming you know, more, more favored as temperature increase. But given our results that didn't really show an obvious, clear dependence of aggregation on temperature, we think that, that it's actually more a function of the existence of aggregation itself and the fact that it dries out the domain on average and enhances the dryness of dry regions and those factors acting across all temperatures to reduce this. And this reduction in climate sensitivity has contributions from both non-cloud and cloud feedback. Now, this, of course, is just one model, and there is actually quite a bit of uncertainty in this. And so we'd like to look at this across a wider range of models. And so to that end, I am involved in the organization of a intercomparison project of models configured in this idealized version of the atmosphere, radiative convective equilibrium. And it's you know, going to involve several different simulations at different temperatures. And at, at the moment, we think we'll have about 20 models participating in it. And the motivation for this is that radiative convective equilibrium is really the simplest possible framework to pose some of the most important questions we have about climate science, questions about changes in clouds and convection with warming, questions about cloud feedbacks and climate sensitivity, questions about aggregation and its role in climate. And so I think and I hope that this sort of experiment is really keeping with the legacy in Charney of Lorenz, who were pioneers of using model hierarchies and trying to determine the simplest possible system in which to um, understand the phenomena that they were interested in and you know, provide, again, a lot of emphasis on mechanisms and physical principles. And so that's the goal that we have with this, this work here. And uh, we're really excited about it. Our paper setting up the model protocol was just accepted last week. And if there's anyone here that has a model they'd like to include, please get in touch with me. So with that, I'm pretty close to wrapping up. And I'd just like to leave you with uh, another movie 
of these simulations I've been talking about. And I hope I've, I've provided some interest in here in saying that these simulations of radiative convective equilibrium, especially in this particular setup with the cloud resolving model, can be valuable for understanding the responses of convection and clouds and circulation to warming and, and probing the mechanisms of convective organization. And I think that, that this work can help us answer some of these big fundamental questions in climate science. Um, but it's also pretty fascinating just to watch it evolve here in the movie. So thank you very much for your attention. Any questions? I'm curious to know why in these simulations you use these long strips or channels as opposed to an aspect ratio of or unity. Is there some physical reason for that or what's the? We, we use this long channel because we wanted to have the opportunity to have multiple convecting regions. When you do it in a square, you generally only get one. Oh. And it also offers more opportunities for interactions between convection and larger scale circulations that develop. And the, the, the con boundary conditions are periodic all the way around? Yes. yes. Yes, this might be antithetical to the assumption of tr you know trying to get things in the simplest system possible, but having spent a large part of my life going out in the field and observing convection, one of the things we always found was there is a very important role of wind shear. Mm. And is anybody looking at that problem, or have you thought about it? Yeah, so in these simulations, there's no mean wind or mean shear imposed. Shears can and do develop on their own, and they do modulate this organization. And in fact, this large scale aggregation is, is generally reduced by the presence of vertical wind shear. Um, and, um, but there are people working on this, but it's, it's underexplored for sure in the context of this particular problem. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.